Good morning and good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Try to do the math. I think it's the fourth webinar in our series on the UN Innovation Toolkit. We've already been speaking about the toolkit in general, its diagnostics, elements, and the innovation profiles. And now we're talking about the space modules. Today, we will be deep diving on the architecture module. Really important for innovation. Thanks for joining us for that. As always, my name is Johanna and I'm from the UN Innovation Network and as always I'm joined by my colleagues from the UN United Nations System Staff College. We have Paula and Baron here. Paula joining from Spain and Baron from Turin from the uh, UNSSC's headquarters. Thanks for joining us this morning, Paula, or this today. Thanks a lot, Johanna. It's a pleasure to, to be here again with all of you. And today, as you have mentioned, we will be focusing on the architecture model. So if we pass to the next slide. This is the team. I hope you already know us and uh, Johanna has kindly introduced us pre uh, previously. So let's go to the next one where you, we will find a poll in order to see if you have joined already any of, other, uh, of our previous webinars uh, on this toolkit series. And now the poll is running. And Paula, I'm feeling optimistic this morning. Eh? No, sorry. 82% of the participants have voted and we see that more than half have joined actually uh, another previous UN Innovation Toolkit webinar, which is great news. Uh, so now we are going to go to a brief recap so for those who have not joined, have uh, at least the big picture of the UN Innovation Toolkit. The first feature of the UN Innovation Toolkit, it's its diagnostic tool. Uh, the diagnostic tool is composed of 27 questions that are um, framed in a way to assess your readiness to innovate from a team, unit or organization perspective. This uh, diagnostic it gives you an innovation profile as well as detailed results. The innovation profile has a description, the strengths and the biggest risks of that profile, as well as uh, guidance for next steps. And also in the, um, in the, in the detailed results, you will find a different scores in the space framework, the strategy, partnerships, architecture, culture and evaluation, framework that you, you can see here. And uh, from there, uh, we actually have the SPACE acronym and all uh, <laughs> this background. And uh, the diagnostic tool will give you a specific scores of each of these pillars uh, to innovation. These uh, scores will also have a justification as well as recommended, uh, recommended next steps. And then you will have five specific recommendations on specific tools for you to use according to the results of your and your profile, innovation profile. So as you can see here, we have the space framework, curated tools that we have 21 with step-by-step uh, uh, by, uh, by step directions, uh, worksheets, case studies, as well as references. Also, we have the diagnostic tool that we have already discussed it. And today we will focus on the architecture model of the space framework, which helps users answer specific questions to systematize our innovation efforts. Thank you very much, Perrin. Here we want to share with you the, a QR code, just in case you want to navigate through the toolkit with us in this session, as well as the, as the link to the UN Innovation Toolkit. Also, we want to share with you the UN System Staff College free course on Introduction to Innovation. This free course to all UN staff is available uh, with this QR code or with this link, and is, um, it was developed uh, linked to the UN Innovation Toolkit. So you will be able to, to deepen your knowledge on innovation as well as on the toolkit. In the next slide, uh, we will start actually with the architecture model, uh, the focus of today's webinar. Well, this architecture model 
if we go to the next slide, is the third module of the space framework. We can see here that we have already uh, went through the strategy and the partnerships model, and now we are in the architecture one. Because uh, it's highly important if, in order to innovate, as innovations rarely fail because of a lack of creativity. They uh, often, they actually fail because organizations lack systems, structures, and processes to repeatedly turn ideas to stay, uh, uh, testable and scalable solutions. So uh, if we go to the next slide, we will see uh, why we need architecture for, par, uh, for innovation. As we have mentioned, the most innovative organizations do not treat innovation as a merely a series of consecutive projects, isolated innovation projects. Rather, they take deliberate, uh, deliberate steps to build their capacity to sustain innovation over time. Therefore, to, uh, by establishing these repeatable, uh, repeatable processes and organizational structures, we organizations reduce the, their reliance on lack on a specific talent individuals or external factors for, innov for innovation success. Instead, this innovation because it becomes repeatable and embedded in the DNA of a, an agency's way of working. Therefore, with this, if we pass to the next slide, well, in this architecture model of the Joint Innovation Toolkit, you will learn or you will uh, the toolkit will support you in four main areas the first one is to source new ideas effectively and from a wide range of stakeholders from a wider ecosystem and to be updated with uh, uh, both trends and new technologies also to apply user-centered design techniques to ensure that solutions reflect the needs of end users and critical stakeholders to plan for scaling since the beginning of the of the design of a innovation project, um, as well as to organize to effectively execute innovation. And with that, we are pleased to now pass to the four UN derived tools in this architecture model, and my colleague Bering will will delve into them. Thank you so much, Paula. And once again, thank you to Johanna and to Yunan for the invitation to present. And uh, Johanna, I think that as with previous sessions, we are inviting participants, if you have any questions, to please simply drop those into the Q&A uh, section that you see there. Happy to discuss those, happy to respond to those. Where we cannot respond to those, we will seek out an answer for you and get back to you. But thank you so much for taking the time to join us from the Staff College here in Turin. It's always a pleasure to be presenting the toolkit. And examining today, the architecture model uh, module, such an exciting module, because what we see, and Johanna, I'm sure that this is something that you just see all the time, is that there are these pockets of excellence that are happening around the system. There are these pockets of innovation. We've got these really focused people, really engaged people, people, units, whatever it is, teams, who are driving innovation, who are delivering some really interesting and innovative ideas, but they tend to stay in pockets. And it's and, and without kind of a structured focus on how to build an architecture to support that from the top, from the bottom, from the sides, from everywhere, a lot of times they tend to stay there as, pocket, as, as these uh, isolated pockets. So what is it that we can do to come together, to bring together some of these uh, insights that we have, some of the best practice, some of the good practice, and, and the contextualization around innovation that happens within these teams or units, and how is it that we can kind of build against our organizational mandate and contribute to that through innovation. That is some of the uh, information, some of the guidance that is built into the architecture uh, model. And so let's get into it. This is the first tool, Scan the Horizon. Now, this is actually, a super popular tool within the toolkit. Um, it helps, uh, as you can see here, it helps organizations source new ideas to address specific challenges. It thinks about, it forces, it forces you as a user to develop a challenge statement to identify the types of ideas that you are seeking to select the most appropriate, appropriate uh, activities and then to execute those activities. So it really does Kind of builds you through this life cycle, at least the start of that process of 
who are we, what are we looking for, and how can we how can we create that? So looking at the objectives of the Scanner Horizon tool, it can help you to select the most effective ideation activity uh, to leverage your organization's human and financial resources. For those of you who have been uh, in these sessions before, and look, let's be honest, this is real for all of us. A lot of times what we see when we're discussing innovation within the UN system is this focus on resources, meaning financial resources. It's critical that we expand a little bit our definition of resources. We talked about this last week when we were, or the, the previous session, when we were examining partnerships, really, really seeing how is it that we can expand this definition of resources to include also, as it says here, human resources, but also social capital, for example, so that you are able to, to better leverage that that exists. Uh, to scan horizon tool can help you to source the right number and type of ideas. Critical, critical, critical. And those of you who have been tuning in to these sessions, I must apologize once again. I'm going to mention it again, this idea of scoping. So the scan horizon tool allows you to really look at what are the ideas that we're after? How can we scope down to our human and financial resources, our social capital resources? what is doable and then how is it that we can uh, engage with the appropriate stakeholders in this ideation process so those are the objectives of the session as uh, excuse me of the uh, of the tool the steps that you will take is working on this challenge statement so this is a challenge uh, this is the question that you will ask your pa participants in your ideation activity to answer so this is really the, a, a super important process to bring down the idea to scope this question down uh, to something that is relevant for your team, for your unit, for your organization, whatever scale it is that you're working to develop this innovative uh, activity. Then you'll create the design statement, you'll then work on how it is to collect ideas, then you'll design and execute your ideation activity. Now, the really critical element to, to consider here is that this is, this is a stepped process to a communication engagement with your stakeholders. A lot of times, what's the quote? I think we brought it up in the last session, that the, the biggest illusion around communication is, is that it's happened. And you know, this this is this is critical when we when we are talking to internally, but also talking to our to our stakeholders and our partners. How is it that we can best design these engagements? How is it that we can best uh, uh, seek these ideas for them from them uh, in the uh, structures in which we exist. Before you begin, now this is all in the tool as well. So before you begin, uh, you'll be encouraged to develop a specific in innovation goal for which you seek to source solutions. Now this is one of those really super elements from within the toolkit which forces you as an individual, as a leader, as a manager, as a team member to have a conversation around what specific goal are we looking for a lot of times and this is uh, uh, this has come up in our conversations already as well people are simply told eh, go and be innovative be just be more innovative this is that chance to really scope really scale and say well what is it that we envision here what is the goal that we are looking for solutions for and then uh, and also you will see here that it is uh, uh, there is a secondary tool which is recommended for you the headlines of the future tool and the headlines of the future tool is another tool in the, in the in the toolkit. It also has UN case studies incorporated in there. And I just wanted to stress, while that this while this tool is recommended in this process, each of the tools is designed to stand alone. If you are only undertaking the Scan the Horizon tool, the steps outlined in that worksheet and in that tool are perfectly fine to stand alone. However, in an effort to increase the the depth of engagement, the depth of thought. That, go, that goes into the design process around some of these tools, there are other tools recommended from the toolkit. So you can really start to deepen your exposure, deepen your experience in the, uh, in the process of innovation. And then there is the case study, and this is, this is where uh, you know, Union was, um, was critical in the design of the toolkit, as well as Union, union partners, Union members uh, throughout the system not only in sourcing some of these case studies but in validating the tools validating some of these case studies as well so you'll see here uh unfpa so you, yeah UN, united nations population fund uh partnering to source ideas for improving sexual reproductive health of, of adolescents and youth so a case study there which 
links all of these elements of the tool. You can, you can see it in real life uh, and then work on that crucial process of contextualization and scoping for your own reality. The next tool, user-centered design. You can see this then flows on. Once you have this idea, well, how do we really make sure that we are designing this for the right people? So this tool helps organizations to ensure that the solutions they are developing reflect the needs of end users. So often, and I will use an example from my own insight uh, and, and experiences I have seen both inside and outside the UN system, I come from an instructional design background. So often the learning solutions that are offered are ones that we already have or that the unit team organization already has. We pick it off a shelf and you plug it in to those users without necessarily a deep understanding of what those users require what those users need. I'm not saying that happens at the UNSSC, of course, but it is something that I have seen in the past. This idea of user-centered design forces us to step back a little bit, get a little bit of perspective and really ask those questions around what are, who are our end users and specifically what are uh, their needs. Okay, so the objectives of the user-centered design tool to learn more about the specific needs and characteristics of your end users, as well as seeking them to develop innovative solutions that reflect these. So a better understanding what these needs are and then ensuring that those needs are reflected in the planning and the development of your innovative uh, intervention and activity. Before you begin in this tool, you will be required to determine the end users and other stakeholders who may be affected by your innovation efforts and allow adequate time to collect end user information and perform necessary research. And again, this is one of those steps that is not traditionally done well, particularly this idea of getting time to, to really engage with end users, collect information and, and perform that research. Even in this process of determining the end users and other stakeholders who may be affected by your innovation efforts, even that is the start point for a huge number of conversations within yourself, within your team, within your unit, with your internal and external stakeholders as well, to understand, do we have a common understanding? Do we have a commonality of approach in regards to uh, identifying and defining even what stakeholders are, what users are? Then we can work on processes which are outlined, for example, in the partnerships tool around how do we identify these stakeholders from the viewpoint of their interests, in this, in this uh, activity, the influence that they may have over this, how does this then, uh, uh, in, how does this then influence our communication strategies? How does this influence how we interview them, how we engage with them? So a critical process that needs to be uh, undergone both as a team or a unit as you are designing this process, but then scaled up when you are engaging with diverse stakeholders and, uh, and partners. The case study, uh, that is uh, incorporated into the user center design tool is not coming up when I click. Come on, internet, there it is. UNHCR applying user center design techniques to incorporate the perspective of refugee entrepreneurs when launching an, an NGO innovation award and hosting startup weekends. So again, an opportunity to see how the steps that are outlined in this tool have been utilized, have been iterated, have been validated from within the UN context to allow you insight into that and allow you also to start considering that critical scoping and contextualization. It worked here, will it work for us? How can it work for us? What are some of the critical differences and similarities that may exist? The next tool. Now, I have, there is a global internet outage at the moment. It's ongoing, so I hope that, uh, I'm gonna blame it on that. Uh, but it seems to be slow today, I apologize. The next tool from pilot to scale, again, this is that next step on this flow, on this, uh, on this process that is incorporated into the toolkit. The pilot to scale tool allows you to, uh, allows organizations um, to really start to consider how is it that we can scale for success. So we, we, we see here that we can, um, not only, not only are we scoping down to what is more relevant for us, acknowledging that we all work in resource poor environments, 
as I've said before, we never have enough time, we never have enough money, we never have enough staff. So we need to really think about where are we investing our social, political and financial capital into these innovations, but then also from the start of these processes, how do we plan to scale this so that we do remove ourselves from that trap that I outlined at the start of these pockets of excellence, these pockets of innovation that may exist throughout an organization. The objectives in the pilot to scale tool, oh, so painfully slow, can help you to uh, design pilots that will ultimately help you scale your innovation, that's in the name, uh, and then also scale your innovation based on capacity building considerations. So here we're considering how is it that you can engage internally, externally with identified stakeholders, build their capacity to undertake the innovative processes and practices that you have outlined do they have the skill and the capacity? If not, how is it that you can build that into your planning processes? The steps that you will take, identify factors that could affect the scaling of your innovation. Again, so much of this, so much of the critical approach to innovation is these conversations that need to happen so that we can better focus our resources and our time. Number two, deploy your pilot and capture critical information to inform scaling. So that's an iteration process. Develop your roadmap, what that means for you and your team, and then develop critically also a checklist so that you can undertake those processes. You can then come back and double check your timelines, the expenses, whatever it is, whatever metric it is that you have defined as a, as a milestone. Come back and really ask yourself, ask your team, hey, look, we planned on, on this being uh, this being ticked off uh, by this stage. Has it been? If so, let's celebrate that. Let's, let's incorporate that into some of our good practices. If not, why not? Why did we assume this was going to take place? What was off in regards to our planning? And how can we then build that into our, our scaling, into our planning in the future to mitigate that moving forward? I see your question there. Uh, Mete, and are there certain tools that are more relevant in case you are primarily involved in policy development and policy advocacy? These questions, Johanna, and thank you for your question. I really appreciate it. And I apologize. I don't ever have a good answer because it's about, it's about what is relevant for your team, for your unit, for your organization at that time. There is, for example, a tool uh, on engaging governing bodies that comes next uh, in, our, in our next session, for example. That's something that is, is perhaps more looking at policy development, more looking at a, at a higher level scale. However, uh, you know, it, it, again, it depends on, on how much access you have to policy development, how much access you have to decision makers, for example, as to which tool is more relevant. What I would suggest is that you undertake the uh, diagnostic process and see what are the recommended tools from there. Then that's a start point for conversations with your team, with your unit, with yourself as to what is what is doable. And Johanna, if you have any comments on that, please do feel free to, to jump in. A vigorous shake of the head and a thumbs up. I'll take it. Um, again, WFP piloting and scale, scaling the Building Blocks project, which is a blockchain-based platform designed to help refugees process financial transactions. That's a super interesting case study. So please do engage with that as well. This is the last tool, I believe, in, the, uh, uh, in this uh, module, uh, which is the operating model. So that is seeking to, working to see how is it, once we have undertaken all of these processes and plan to scale, how is it that we can then integrate in innovation into these normal business operations? How is it that we make it the new normal, which is a phrase I really have grown to not like, but the, how do we make innovation simply what we do around here? And I think that is, that is a critical uh, discussion that needs to take place. So we're talking about allocating resources, as it says here, how is it that we can effectively uh, design this operating model? How is it we can select that uh, based on the resources? And then we can consider all of the elements which will contribute to the development of this overarching architecture including, as it says here, governance, staffing, organizational structure. So, um, Meta, to your question as well, perhaps this operating model is more at that level of policy development and policy advocacy as well. The objectives of the operating model tool, 
so that you can understand leading uh, options to formalize and sustain innovation efforts, selecting an operating model that fits your innovation goals, and considering the governance, staffing, and organizational structure. The steps that you will take, and again, there are downloadable, there's a downloadable worksheet for each of these tools, which has each of these steps outlined, and you can undertake this individually, you can engage internally with teams or units, you can work with stakeholders on this, really great opportunities to communicate, to, to plan, to scope, to scale, to contextualize. So the steps that you'll take through this tool, you'll identify and prioritize the design criteria, you will map that criteria to existing operating models, and then you, you will be forced to consider the governance, staffing, and organizational structure needed for your operating model. So you can see there is a flow through all of these tools, and this final tool really ends with, hey, look, you've iterated all of these processes, you've got some proofs of concept, you've seen what works, what doesn't work, presumably you've got some failures that you can uh, learn from, you've got some successes that you can promote and celebrate. How is it then that this becomes what we do around here? How is it that this simply becomes the organizational structure focused on promoting innovation before you begin once again this headlines of the future tool the headlines of the future tool and in fact there is a great blog piece that's just been published carla can i get you to drop the link of that into the chat a great blog piece that has been shared by colleagues at ifad uh, working on exactly this utilizing the tool ifad's doing some incredible work in regards to um, mainstreaming the toolkit uh, and so we really need to to celebrate that and some um, interest an interesting blog piece being developed by them uh, for uh, utilizing this headlines of the future tool. So I recommend that you do read that as well. And of course, if you also have experience iterating, utilizing, contextualizing the tools from the toolkit, please do get in touch with us here at the college and we will be happy to work with you on promoting that and sharing some of your insights. The case study for the operating model tool is ITC, uh, working to build the innovation labs and the innovation champions program, uh, really working to see how they can mainstream creativity and innovation across the organization. So once again, you can see that that is linked to this larger scale of the architecture of the whole organization. Thank you for dropping the headlines of the future blog, uh, blogs uh, uh, address in there. So now we have two, the most popular tools in the architecture model are the um, scan the horizon tool and the user centered design model. And as we have been uh, doing in these sessions, we now offer you a chance to decide which tool would you like to delve into a little bit deeper today? Scan Horizon tool or the user-centered design tool? Please feel free to fill out the poll. It's like a choose your own adventure book. It is how will the story end, eh? But we always <coughs> know that I am determined to get at least 70% of people voting. So I think that's a good, that's a good threshold to, right? to seek. We need to get people to come back and tune in. So tell us what you're most interested in. Leaving it open for a few more seconds. Come on, we can get higher than 57%. 60. All right. Fine. I admit defeat today. Baron, what was your what was your guess? <laughs> I always like to have you guess. I had guessed, I had guessed uh, user-centered design simply because there's more, it's more of a term we know and use. So okay. Yeah. Well, and I think you're right for the third time in a row. Oh, the third time in a row! <laughs> well done to you. You know you use it. <laughs> this is great. The user said, I mean, uh, for those of you who had voted for the Scan Horizon tool, please do get into it because it, it is super important. Uh, and it's that start point that is often skipped. Uh, and, and I get it. I mean, we've all been there. We, 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 don't, we never have enough time. We, we have pressures oftentimes where we are trying to be innovative. We're doing it on our own. Uh, we're doing it on our own time. We're doing it as an aside to the expectations and objectives we already have. And so a lot of times we just jump straight into what we think is a good idea. However, really working to develop a, a, a practice, develop a process of stepping back and undertaking the, the scan horizon processes uh, really does contribute to a better understanding of who we are, what we have to offer, what is out there, and where do we want to take this, which of course contributes not only to, to innovation in general, but to this architecture. 
But let's jump into user-centered design and go a little bit deeper. Now you have seen all of this. I have introduced this in this session and you have the video to go back to, but let's go a little bit deeper into the steps. Now, step one, create are we, your- Are we talking scan the horizon or user-centered design? Oh my goodness, look at me, I jumped forward. I did, look at this, I'm sorry. I got too excited. <laughs> Apologies, everybody. User-centered design, I'll go backwards. Goodness gracious. Thank you for stepping in. Here we are at user-centered design. Here's one I prepared earlier. Okay, so let's jump in. Step one, gather data about your innovation and users. And I, I think I mentioned earlier on, again, this is also not really done systematically well. I mean, there are people, uh, there are agencies, there are teams, units who obviously are doing this well. Certainly coming from a learning background, it's important for us to undertake uh, learning needs assessments, for example, but it's almost the step before that as well. And one of the risks I, I guess we, we run is, is feeling familiarity or assuming that we have an understanding of our end users uh, before, uh, and they're just jumping into the design process. But again, undertaking this step, formalizing this step, making this a non-negotiable step in our innovation planning allows us to really scope and contextualize not only for our end users, not only for our mandates, but as I mentioned earlier on, for our social capital, our political capital, our financial capital that we will be expending on this innovation. This allows us to ensure that it is much, much more targeted. So through this process, you have a data collection worksheet so you are really asking people about values, priorities, their needs. You are then asking what are our, what are our gaps? What do we, do we know what we don't know? Uh, and that's a really important question to ask for anyone, for an innovator, certainly for a leader, for a manager. We, we do a lot of uh, training. One of the other hats I wear here at the college is uh, designing our executive management programming for, uh, for the secretariat. So we're delivering to 400, 450 managers a year. Uh, you know, five month program on, uh, on management. Uh, and one of those elements just that, that stepping back and saying, what is it that I don't know about this? Do I know what I don't know is a, is a critical step that often people don't take enough time to undertake. We need to be thinking about the details. We need to be thinking about a common frame of reference. And once again, this is that chance for a discussion, a conversation as to how do we get to a common frame of reference? If we don't have a common frame of reference now, why not? How can we overcome that? Then you'll be looking at data collection techniques, you'll be looking at observation, focus groups, in-depth interviews. Now, of course, this is thrown out a little bit by COVID. Uh, and certainly, uh, if I think back to uh, one of my previous roles, whereby I spent uh, a number of weeks in, in uh, on, on, on mission in, in a certain country, uh, seeking to undertake uh, communication, to undertake interviews uh, around the design of a learning program, it was a learning management uh, and, and knowledge management system that we were proposing. Uh, and we had to be very, very nimble in regards to these processes because of security concerns, because of local cultural concerns, because of who we were as a team. And so this is a fluid process that you need to kind of build that flexibility in to come back to and, and pivot from as well. The worksheet that is involved in here, I'm just going to highlight this. Now, again, this one has been completed for you. This is available in the tool itself. And there is a then subsequently a worksheet, a blank worksheet, which is which you can fill out that is available in the toolkit as well. But we can see here, step one, considering the case of an organization that is focused on driving economic development within its region by facilitating cross-border travel and commercial activity with a neighboring country. To support this effort, the organization is seeking to understand the behaviors of commercial travelers, commercial travelers at the border. So it's got, you can see on the left here, they've decided to undertake a focus group. They, you can see the date, you can see the, uh, the year there, the, the location that they are undertaking this, you can see the numbers of people that they have interacted with, you can see the standardization of the questions. Now that's critical as well, because that, those questions have come out of a discussion process internally, externally with stakeholders, thinking about what is it that we want to design, what, what is the information that we want to get, 
and ensuring that there is a standardized approach so that if you have diverse teams, for example, if you've got a team at another border crossing, they are also asking the same questions. So this is that chance to really standardize that before you undertake this process. Then you've got the key activities. What steps do your, uh, do your users uh, engage in to, to accomplish their task? You've got the environment. Where and when do they engage in acti their activities? What do they like about these, pro these processes? The interactions question, what people and objects do they interact with when engaging in these activities? Their dislikes, their constraints, and then, and then some additional questions that you can see there. So you can understand that from that, uh, from those questions, you are really starting to understand who your users are, what are their concerns, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, what do they like, what do they don't like, what are the processes that they have to undertake. And I'm reminded also of a program, a training program that I uh, undertook uh, with, uh, with civil servants from Afghanistan many years ago. And it was uh, a simple, it was, we were undertaking processes like this, it was on tax reform, and we went out to the um, we went out to the uh, balcony of the hotel, a big, you know, open open area of the hotel, and we had these participants stand. We had one person stand and say, "Okay, you're the you're the person who wants to to find out about their taxation uh, requirements." And then we had all of the other participants stand, moving backwards from that person, and be all of the people and processes that they had to go through in order to understand that. And in the end, out of the 26 people, we ran out of participants because there were more than 26 steps that they had to go through. And so that was starting this discussion as to, well, now we understand some pain points. Now we understand what the process is like for that person and what is it that we can do uh, about fixing that. So again, all of these processes, understanding what is required uh, from our user's point of view. Then we work to bring together the, um, the worksheet. This is a part that I absolutely love because it involves post-it notes. I'm a huge fan of post-it notes. Post-it notes, I use post-it notes just all over the walls. It's so much fun. What about this? What about this? This goes over here. Of course, it can be done online. Of course, it can be done on whiteboards. Whatever the process that you agree on, and that depends on where your team is dispersed to, you can really start considering what are some of the patterns that we're seeing what are some of the commonalities we're seeing? What are some of the differences that we're seeing? What are some of the outliers? And really starting to, to, to scope into what does our innovation effort look like? So here you're discussing what key challenges do they, do they face, which you would then like to solve? What are some of the uh, underlying reasons for these? Uh, and what activities that they like might be lost if we undertake this, uh, this innovation process. That's a really critical one as well, because there is a lot of unintentional loss uh, in project design, as we all know. So just to bring up the worksheet for uh, number for step two. And I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the, my, the, the comment here uh, from anonymous intending more comment than a question. What I liked about user centered design is it applies everywhere. When working with beneficiaries, governments, or internal HR, there's always a user we need to keep in mind. Absolutely, absolutely, couldn't agree more. And this is the this is the thing because we risk we risk developing blanket procedures and blanket approaches for users rather than really understanding uh, the needs, the likes, the dislikes of of different users at different times and locations, for example. So that's absolutely critical. I agree, uh, Pedro. I see your question. I'll uh, I'll. Actually, I'll, I'll answer that now. That's a good question. Are the tools only available for UN staff or can we apply share them with external partners that we work with? At my job, I work with a lot of social enterprises and the companies on the network that would really benefit from so many of these tools. Pedro, I have wonderful news for you. The UN Innovation Toolkit was designed from the ground up as a common good. So this is available freely, not only to anybody within the UN system, but anybody outside of the UN system. When they are registering, they can simply uh, scroll down to other non-UN user and they are able to use this and this is one of those really cool things uh, that we had discussed earlier on uh, and, and that we see with the toolkit is that it allows this commonality of language and a commonality of, of thought around what is innovation, what can it mean to us. Now, of course there are other definitions, there are different approaches and practices, we're not saying this is the best one. What we are saying is that these are ones that have been iterated within the system. These are ones that have been validated from within the system. 
And these are ones also that allow for that discussion and that commonality of, of the very least definitions approaches. There is uh, in the toolkit also, there is a bibliography or a glossary at least of, um, uh, of terms around innovation, which is often a, a really big hurdle. Commonality of definition. So, so Pedro, to your question, please feel free to share this, to share this link, to encourage people to, to use this absolutely free and open. So thank you. Step two in action, using the synthesis worksheet to distill the data collected uh, in the data collection worksheet into themes and then synthesize these themes into insights and offer opportunities. So then you can see here, you've got these data points that you have collected on whatever theme that you decide, you've then got the insights. And so you're, you're really considering uh, what this means for your users. So let's take this first one uh, at this border crossing. We've seen that special rates for business travelers at hotels and conference centers is, is, is important for them. Uh, there's frequent interaction with the community of business travelers. Okay, so people, this tells me that in fact, with people spending more time at the border, there's actually business uh, being, being undertaken there. Stopping for gas and finding lodging are required. Communication with the home office and business interests are important. Travelers wish there was a more convenient way to get to the economic uh, urban center. So then you've got the summary, which is staying in the, in the urban center during travel. So that is that start point of well, what is it that we can then deliver design that will uh, make this process easier? How is it that we can uh, uh, promote the, the things that people like? How is it that we can make, mitigate the things that people didn't like? So again, that process of, uh, of synthesis and scoping and contextualization and that real consideration around what is important, what is doable, what were our assumptions? Do our assumptions align with this? If not, why not? What did we, what did we assume uh, erroneously? Uh, about our users in the past. Then we have step three, articulate how insights affect your uh, end users. So you're talking about developing uh, user personas. We do this a lot at the college, uh, but then also their journey map. So the user personas representing a cluster of users with similar patterns, they aren't going to be all the same. This was what we were mentioning just before. Oftentimes there's just this blanket communication approach or, or project approach. This allows uh, for clusters of users to be to be separated and then consideration to be undertaken in regards to communication processes, engagement strategies, those sorts of things. And then it illustrates these subgroups who may be impacted. Then you'll be undertaking journey maps. So then you will be able to kind of outline these end users that you have identified, what are the systems that they interact with, and then what is our role, what is our scope uh, for engagement within that. The worksheet, again, uh, this is all broken down in the worksheet, which is downloadable from the toolkit. Uh, you go through, you've, you've made this, uh, this uh, persona, this one they've named Catherine, uh, the sister's name, that's fine. Uh, you've got the quotes, that the uh, representative quote, which is nice just to kind of focus discussion to come back to when you're considering who this person is. You're thinking about their core traits, you're thinking about their needs, you're thinking about their frustrations, which will probably differ from other personas. So then it's this discussion around how do these personas fit together. You've then got these pain points uh, that are developing. And of course, you can see there where, where, the, where the good stuff is highlighted in the green. We're discussing how can we improve that? How can we capitalize on that? Where it is in the red, how can we mitigate that? How can we turn red to green? How can we make this process less painful for our users that we've now identified? Step four, identify opportunities for innovation. So that's that next step. There's obviously going to be a number of opportunities for innovation. How do we scope to what is doable? How do we scope to what is going to have the most impact, for example? So you need to ask yourself uh, here how the innovation addresses these end user challenges, improves the most difficult challenges that the, uh, the user face and faces, and then how does it help send uh, the users to achieve their goals and their desires. So again, you, you're seeing this as a process. You're seeing this as a process of challenging your own assumptions, challenging the assumptions of your team. It's breaking up this really big idea of our users into actionable units that can be, uh, you can develop personas around, you can understand better their needs, their wants, their desires, their challenges. And then that allows you to scope better your innovative uh, process your innovative intervention that you are working to design. And that's it for that tool.
for the user centered design tool. So I am going to open up for questions. I see here uh, a comment. Thank you, Paola. Look at that. See, Paola's the, the genie we wish. So, uh, yes, the, Baron, nice. before we Baron, before we go to the last uh, the last question that I see in the box, I yes. just I just wanted to say that what I really like about human centered uh, about uh, user centered design, human centered design, it's like a muscle that you can once you have it, you can flex it and practice it everywhere. So nowadays when i have an idea and I, you know i think it's the best idea in the world naturally but it's like ah oh, let me go just go check with a few people and you can do the full you know you can go through the full tool but once you're in the right mindset you can apply it to everything that you're doing in your work so i really like that about uh, user-centered design and i have to say what i really like about the toolkit is that it's just full of inspirations and case studies and practical examples that can help me as a user uh, make sure I'm going in the right direction with the tool. I feel inspired and I know exactly what I need to be doing here. What are the key questions I need to think about? Um, what are the considerations I need to make? So really like that. Um, and saying again a big thank you to everyone who contributed to it because uh, while we helped bring people together, um, it was really, I think, 30 plus year entities who reviewed and provided input. So just thanks again for that. Um, and indeed, I have another question for you. Yes. Um, and I think it was from previously in your presentation when we talked about the pilot to scale tool. Mm -hmm. And here the colleague is saying often innovations are piloted by different parts of the organization that would scale them. So you might have an innovation team that might incubate, but then you want, I don't know, a program team to take to scale. How do you suggest involving the team that would scale even at early stages when success isn't guaranteed and when they might not even yet be interested in the idea? Yeah, no, that's super important. Um, there are, there are processes outlined in the toolkit around this, but I would suggest that, you know, if I, if I do focus on the toolkit, it's going to be for me, the, the diagnostic process. And again, simply because the diagnostic process allows you to have those conversations, they allow you to have a conversation within your team or your unit as to what is innovation, what can it mean, what is our definition? All those are really, all those really important uh, discussions that need to take place then based on that and based on the feedback that you get from the toolkit around your readiness to innovate, that can then be shared. It can be summarized, it can be put into one page or whatever it is, but then that can be shared with, for example, uh, some of these uh, other entities uh, that may be interested, but just need to be, I'm not going to use the word just, that may be interested, but need to be communicated with as to what is, what is this? what is the benefit what is the potential benefit what is our role what is our responsibility what is our timeline all of those things that we know when we engage with for example risk averse uh, teams managers whatever it is all of the questions that they need to uh, they need to answer that they need that they need answered and i think that even if we come to user centered design there's some practices in there that could be undertaken for engaging with management for engaging maybe not management for uh, not just management, for engaging with gatekeepers, for example, people who perhaps are risk averse, undertake maybe this, this process and think about what are their pain points? What, why are they, what are they worried about? What are they, what are they positive about? How is it that we can communicate with them? What is the hook that we need to identify for them? So I think that it, it, it comes back to obviously communication. This is the big thing uh, around the toolkit and, and, and certainly uh, around a lot of the training that we undertake here at the college, uh, but also being able to engage with gatekeepers from an informed perspective. So that obviously they'll have questions, that is perhaps why they're pushing back, understanding what are those questions, thinking about how, what, what answers that you have, how they, how they are scoped. Also, and I mentioned this last week, and this is really important, um, you know, innovation is change and people, Fear change. I said this last week, right? The people who the people last week, the week before, the people who say they support change tend to support change in other people, not in themselves. And so, you know, this needs to this this transition needs to be really thought through. One of the things that we we um, uh, that we really push in our change management training for our for our managers uh, uh, in in the program that I'm running here also uh, is a, is is that. People don't necessarily fear, fear change, they fear loss. 
And so it's a loss of seniority or it's a loss of expertise or it's the loss of being the guy who knows everything or it's whatever that loss is, you need to understand what that is and you need to have uh, a response to that and, and be there to support them through that process. So considering from the end user, from this person that you are engaging with, what are their pain points? What are their, uh, what are their motivators? What are their stresses? I think that is, that is absolutely critical. And going with showing that you have undertaken a, a lot of these initial scoping processes so that when those questions do come, you can respond from a, from a position of competence, from a position of you know, data. Thank you very much. Um, Paula, did you want to add? Yeah, of, uh, if I may, actually, I would like to point out that uh, there's uh, certain guidelines and, and steps to, to actually conduct in the uh, plan to scale tool, which actually helps you uh, to, to deploy your pilot and capture critical information to inform scaling. And also after, after having capturing this information, we have another tool that even if, if it's not in the architecture uh, model, it might help uh, in this information and communication process that is uh, define a value proposition. Mm -hmm. So for instance, there's uh, different uh, options available that you can of course uh, see in the tool, in the toolkit and uh, the diagnostic will actually uh, support you in this. Fantastic, great addition, thanks Paula. And of course, one could argue there's even interlinkages back to the uh, user-centered design tool, right? Because if the mm -hmm. program unit eventually might be a user, well, then we should make sure to involve them at the beginning and scoping this project. So interlinkages everywhere, important to keep them in mind. Um, Baron and Paula, I have a last question for you. It's a, actually a simple but very nice question. I wish the, the colleague had put their name here. At which step of the innovation journey should user-centered design workshops take place? Should it be when we have a problem to solve? Or should it be when we want to know what the problems for the users are? Second one. Second one. Yeah, I mean, for me, that's that's the process, and 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 I understand, and and I've seen it, and I've been there, and I've lived it. It's difficult. It's difficult to propose and plan for and implement that step back and that undertake that perspective because we're pushed, we're pushed, we're pushed to have answers. We're expected to have answers. We're expected to have projects. We're expected to know who our users are. Go go go. It is important, however, to really step back and ask those questions. Do we know what we don't know? Do we know who our users are or are we assuming who our users are? So for me, uh, to that question, when we, when we want to know what the problems are from our users, that is the base point for user-centered design to really just clarify what are the needs of this user? What are their pain points? What do they like? What do they not like? What are the processes they have to go through? And then that gives us a, a much better understanding. This is what, one of those elements of the user-centered design uh, tool that I really like is that, is that journey. And you'll recall there was that, you know, this, 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 this kind of U shape where things are pretty good when I'm waiting at the border under this case, and then it's just awful. And I think we've all been through that as you know, customs control and things like this. And so then you've got actionable, scopable units that you can step back and you can plan around. And if you understand that there is, uh, there is a problem at this stage of the journey, you can really focus in on what do we know about that? What is the timeline around them? What does it cost us? What, is, what does it cost them? All of those metrics that you can then design interventions for, you can iterate and then you can, can re-examine is so, so critical. Uh, you know, even when we think about project planning, when we think about uh, uh, assigning roles, assigning responsibilities, assigning communications, all those sorts of things can be done on a much more scope level as opposed to go and fix the border control stuff. It's more about there's this element that we've identified, you have expertise in this, you have insight in this, let's really engage around, around this. So it's a scoping issue for me. So yeah, that, that, that I think the, the, the journey element of the tool is, is absolutely critical to understand our users. Thank you very much for that. Good answer to what I thought was a good question. I loved it. I think it's a great <laughs> question. Yeah. yeah. And with that, I think we are out of questions for today. So I'm going to say thank you for joining us again. Learned a lot about architecture and user-centered design today. And I am really excited about seeing you guys in two weeks when we finally talk about culture. I'm culture so is excited. the big one, right? Culture yeah, is the culture, big one. It's culture the, is the big one. It's yeah. a critical no one. Everyone wants to change, but it's so hard to get right. And you already alluded to 
celebrating successes and discussing failures openly today. So I'm really excited to go into that. Um, in two weeks, same time. And I hope then we are for once not going to be cursed by technology issues. So no video issues, no audio and the internet at the speed that it's supposed to be. Let's keep fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, right? <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for joining us. And thanks everyone on the line for being with us this today and uh, wishing you a good day and see you very soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Johanna. Always a pleasure. Take Thank care, you. everyone. Johanna, thanks, Barry. Thanks, everyone.